Hello, and welcome to this session on how to guard the guardians themselves, strategies to support political decision-making with Max Stauffer. I'm Habiba Islam, and I'll be the MC for this session. Quick shout out to Brian Tan, who's created a collaborative note-taking document for the conference. You can find that link in the Slack announcements channel if you'd like to contribute. For this session, we'll start with a 20 minute talk by Max, and then we'll move on to a live Q&A session where he'll respond to your questions. You can submit your questions in your name or anonymously using the box to the right hand side of this video. You can also vote for your favorite questions to push them higher up the queue, and then we'll try to get through as many as we possibly can. After 20 minutes of questions, I'll bring the Q&A to an end. But that's not the end of the session. To help you think through and apply the ideas you've heard, I'll be asking you to join a 20 minute icebreaker session where you'll have two speed meetings with other attendees to discuss your thoughts on the content. I'll explain how to do that when we get there. But now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session. Max Stauffer is a science policy officer at the Geneva Science Policy Interface, which seeks to build bridges between scientists and the United Nations. He's also the founding co-president of EA Geneva and a founding partner at the Social Complexity Lab. Max's background is in international relations and complex systems, and he's currently co-writing a book on placing long-termism at the core of policymaking. Here's Max. Hello, everyone. My name is Max Schaffer. I work for the Geneva Science Policy Interface, and I'm excited to present you the preliminary results of a research that I'm conducting together with Conrad Seifert from Effective Altruism Geneva. Um, our research focuses on how to guard the guardians themselves. That is, how can we support policymakers in their decision making? So the key points of my talk are with respect to how to improve political decision making are the following. So first, um, we believe that we should focus on information processing and heuristic decision making instead of bombarding, so to say, decision makers with more information, even if that information is more accurate. Uh, second, we found that while popular measures and diversity, they do not seem adequate to support political decision making. And in contrast, we found that other strategies like multi-criteria decision analysis and serious games seem much more promising um, to support uh, decision making. So what are the implications and next steps of this research? First, um, more careful experimentation is needed before better synthesis can be done. Uh, and this is quite important. Um, second, we need more analysis of more strategies, and especially in specific contexts and for specific types of problem. And um, overall, what we did is uh, we provided a conceptual basis and a method to think about improving political decision making and to guide further research. And in this talk, I'm going to explain to you how we uh, arrived to those conclusions. So the context behind this research is the following, is that political institutions are essential, but they're difficult to influence. Uh, they're essential because they enable large scale collective action. Uh, for example, regulation that many other actors actually cannot implement. Um, but the problem is that policymaking is, is a complex process. It features many different actors that have different interests. Um, it also has complicated legal, technical, and social processes. And it is also highly institutionalized in the sense that policymakers are generally expert in their domain and they know how to navigate policymaking systems really well. And if we want to improve policymaking, we need in-depth knowledge about those processes. Um, and as a response to this difficulty, uh, what we've been working on is a book um, that is called Long-Term Political Decision-Making that aims to provide guidance on how to understand policy-making systems and how to engage in them uh, with a perspective to make them more uh, long-term. And while this book is um, uh, focusing on long-termism, um, today, I'm going to present you the most cause neutral chapter that is about improving decision making. And the puzzle addressed in this chapter 
answers of the four following questions. How can policy actors improve their decision making and what does that even mean? Uh, what strategies can be implemented? What do we know about existing strategies? And what can we recommend based on the current state of evidence? The way one solves um, this puzzle depends on how one looks at uh, policy making. And there are actually different ways one can understand policy making. One can look at it as a black box that blends a mix of social and technical input into policies. Or one could look at it as like a set of formal procedures, such as the relationship between the legislative and ex executive branches of a government. Or one could look at the uh, process of policy formation, from agenda setting to policy design to policy implementation and evaluation, like the policy cycle. Or one could analyze uh, the dynamics of policy making and analyze when policy making changes in response to what and to what extent. Um, or one could look at it as a social network. Uh, policy making is a set of individuals whose interaction leads to the emergence um, of policies. And it is actually this last conceptualization that we're using in our chapter. And in fact, um, this still allows us to conceive policy making as a social network, yes, but that is embedded in formal procedures, policy cycle that also generates macro trends. So if one zooms into this um, social network, one can identify policy teams, um, basically a group of individuals that need to make sense of the world um, and design policies. The question we're asking is, how can we support the decision making of these policy teams? And there is actually a vast literature on uh, decision-making support through information. That is the provision of better evidence, better predictions, or like better um, policy-relevant publications to support decision-making. And that has been the focus of policy analysis, uh, system analysis, and etc. And today, there are even systematic reviews that explain how to do this job really well. And I highly recommend uh, reading uh, these studies. But there's another stream of literature that emphasizes the importance of information processing. That is, how do people uh, select and use information, and how do they turn this information into decisions? And this is highly related to the literature on bounded rationality and heuristic decision making that says that humans, in the face of uncertainty, like in policy contexts, they rely on decision-making heuristics um, based on an interplay of what happens in their brains and their environment, including information supply. And this just means that like, information supply is not um, the only part of the puzzle. So the question is, then, what is the impact of information processing strategies in policy contexts and in collective settings? And while we were looking for answers in the literature, we did not find reviews that would actually compare different strategies and look at their respective impact on uh, decision making. And as a result, we decided to conduct a review um, ourselves. So one can imagine the hundreds, if not thousands of ways uh, we could use to like, improve information processing and decision making. So what we did is that we conducted a literature review and 30 interviews with policy scholars and policy makers to better understand the option space. We identified 12 strategies and narrowed down the set to four strategies. So in the end, we analyzed um, the four that you see on the slide, uh, including multi-criteria decision analysis, or MCDA, um, which is essentially a formal process to guide decision makers in their prioritization. Um, we also analyzed serious games, which are in-person simulations that allow decision makers to experience the outcomes of the decisions and navigate uh, complex problems, but in a simulated setting. We reviewed nudging, which consists of simple changes in the choice architecture of decision makers. And we reviewed um, diversity in teams that consist of increasing different types of diversity, like background diversity, seniority diversity, or ethnic diversity, in decision-making teams. Um, our method is a quasi-systematic review 
that builds upon two syntheses that we conducted beforehand. So on the left, in synthesis one, uh, we reviewed the characteristics of political decision making and uh, drivers of better collective decision making. Um, and with that, we could identify 14 variables under effects and fit to analyze the impact of strategies. In synthesis two, um, we reviewed frameworks to evaluate the, the state of evidence of strategies and also to evaluate interventions in complex systems. And with that, we could take four variables that include literature size, evidence quality, consistency, and context um, to then evaluate evidence and strength. So based on these two syntheses, we could conduct our um, quasi-systematic review of strategies, um, then analyze impact and evidence strength and deliver results. So we identified 194 references um, and we reviewed 111 of them, which were more or less equally distributed uh, into the four strategies. And on the right, uh, you can see the distribution of type of literature according to each strategy. So on the first line, you can see that our assessment of MCDA was heavily based on um, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and other reviews. Um, while on the last line, you can see that our analysis of diversity was mostly based on uh, experimental studies, uh, which already shows that different strategies benefit from different levels of maturity in their respective fields. Um, in terms of the results on impact and evidence strength, so for the impact, um, we evaluated each strategy according to those two dimensions, effects and fit. In effects, we evaluated the extent to which um, strategies contribute to the drivers of better collective decision making, like facilitation, group cohesion, uh, intra group interaction, uh, clear process structures, and etc. And in fit, we assess the extent to which strategies um, fit political context, including epistemic uncertainty, moral uncertainty, time constraints, slow feedback loops, and etc. And we score strategies using binary scores. And we use binary scores because the literature was not precise enough to have like a more specific analysis. So we could only assess whether the strategy tackles one variable or uh, doesn't. Um, on, at the bottom of the, of the table, you can see already that MCDA and serious games um, score much better than the two other strategies. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, on the right, uh, in terms of evidence strength, um, you can see that each strategy scores um, somewhat like medium in terms of evidence strength, um, but for different reasons. If you take nudging, for example, there the evidence uh, quality and the quality of experimental studies uh, were scored as high. Um, but this literature uh, actually shows inconsistent results and also doesn't fit uh, political context really well. Um, then in contrast, if you look at MCDA, um, you see um, a much better consistency and a contextual applicability, but there the evidence quality, meaning the, the quality of the data and of the experimental studies um, is much lower. For diversity, for example, there you see that you have like a low quality, but also like a very low uh, consistency. And this is also because um, the literature is not very clear about what diversity actually means. Um, and then in terms of context, there the studies were mostly applied to um, organizations and companies that very rarely into um, a political context. And then for serious games, what you can see is something very similar as uh, serious games, where context applicability is high, um, consistency is, is okay, but the data quality um, and the experimental studies are actually quite weak. Um, and here is uh, the main result of the chapter, um, which depicts the expected impact of strategies. Um, with the reported impact on the x-axis and the evidence strength on the y-axis. And you can already see uh, two clusters, uh, one on the right with MCD and serious games um, that seem actually uh, robust and, and promising in supporting decision making, and on the left, diversity and nudging, which seem much less promising um, than MCDA and serious games. 
And this is the case because MCD and serious games actually are really fit for political context. And the literature is actually about um, political decision making. Um, while, for, for example, in diversity, the literature is generally not about political context um, and also shows inconsistent results in terms of impact. Um, while most of the impact is about innovation, which is not exactly the same as a better quality decision. And nudging is actually so low because 100% of the literature does not tackle political decision making context. Uh, instead, um, nudging uh, seems most beneficial for very simple decisions like password selection, food choices, or like energy consumption, which are not decisions you actually find um, in policy making. Um, so, so those results are preliminary, as I said, um, but there are still limitations that um, constrain the value of this research regardless. Um, so first, there's an extreme difficulty in estimating the counterfactuals and the flow through effects of those strategies. So while we could assess them according to the drivers of better collective decision making, we could not assess the impact on uh, whether they, have, they lead to better policies or not, uh, especially in, in ethical stakes. We, we don't know whether MCDA leads to helping more people to, to, to a better extent. Um, secondly, um, it's also difficult to compare uh, different strategies according, according to the same metrics. And there, since we didn't find um, past literature that actually uh, does that, we had to pioneer a method here and is um, a lot of improvement that could be made. Then the strategies, they do target uh, decision-making and social processes, but they're only loosely related to information processing. So they're not completely, they do not completely reply to the, to the puzzle uh, we posed, um, as they do not um, directly focus on how people perceive and use information. We only focus on a tiny subset of strategies, only four, which is very tiny representation of the entire option space. Um, and the four strategies could be combined um, in the sense that MCDA nudging and diversity could actually be features of a serious game. Uh, but we did not account for these dependencies. And lastly, and um, ironically, um, changing information processing likely requires to provide information in the first place. Um, so for example, if we would want um, policymakers to use MCDA, we would probably need to um, give it a, a, an MCDA training um, before uh, and thus provide information. And as a result, we do not solve the puzzle um, of um, solving how people actually use information. So we are still constrained by uh, policymakers consuming the information they want and the information they can. So as a conclusion, how to guide the guardians themselves? Um, so first, um, we need to understand that policymaking is a very information-rich environment. And we need to understand that just bombarding decision makers with more information, even if that information is not accurate, uh, will not necessarily lead to better decisions. And instead, uh, we believe that we need to equip decision makers with tools to select the right information and transform it into better decisions. Um, so take, taking this perspective, and in this review, we, we found that uh, nudging and diversity, while they're quite popular in the literature and in practice, they do not seem adequate to support uh, political decision making, as they do not tackle uh, the drivers of better collective decision making. Um, and in contrast, we found that MCDA and serious games um, seem much more promising um, in, in helping policymakers arrive at the right uh, decisions. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, first, we need uh, more careful experimentation uh, with actual empirical evaluations of those strategies before uh, better synthesis can be done. And this is the case because our synthesis was mostly based on um, references of low to mediocre quality. Second, we need more analysis of more strategies to have a better understanding of the option space, but we also need analysis of more specific context to understand the usefulness of certain strategies for certain problems. 
Um, and lastly, what we did overall is that we provide uh, a conceptual basis and a method to think about improving political decision-making processes and to guide uh, future research. And we would be quite happy if um, other researchers would pick up on this and do a, like a much better job. Uh, and we think that this research is actually quite important and, and feasible because decision-making is so much at the core of, of policy-making processes that if we do a good job at it, we might actually have a better idea of how to strengthen decision making and potentially improve policy making as a result and hopefully um, improve the world. Uh, so, this is all on my hand. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the QA. Thank you for that talk, Max. I see we've had lots of questions submitted already, so let's just dive in. Um, to start with, uh, could you give us a bit of context about the, the book of which that talk was focusing on one particular chapter? So just tell us a bit more about like what you're doing with the book and um, what kinds of topics you cover and what audience it's for. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. So, so the book is, is a project that we started about 18 months ago. Um, when at EA Geneva, we were thinking about, okay, how can the EA community actually think about improving policy making and what does it even mean? Um, and throughout uh, the past year and a half, we've evolved in our thinking um, also by reviewing the literature on understanding policy making and improving policy making. And we realized that there's actually a lot to learn from this literature. Um, and that we could actually raise um, the standards uh, in the EA community on how we can approach uh, policy making. And um, we are a group of like long-termists, so we take a long-termist perspective to it. And basically what we do is we aim for a short format, so it's um, 50,000 words uh, book, and five chapters. So we have one chapter on why political institutions actually um, important and effective instruments um, to foster long-termism, um, partly because they enable that large-scale action and regulation. We also explain why they're currently a short-termist and uh, then sketch basically the needs, the, the answers we need to, to, the questions we need to answer to, to go further. And we have one chapter that is on understanding policymaking from the bottom up. So there's a lot of talk on like political institutions as like large macro structures. Um, and we basically want to de delve into uh, political behavior, uh, the drivers of political attention, and basically what influences priority setting in, in policy. And then in the third chapter, we try to address um, how to engage robustly uh, in policy making. And there we review the evidence from the advocacy, lobbying, and epistemic communities literatures. Um, and we derive then advice. Uh, for long-termist uh, political engagement. Um, so what kind of strategies, what kind of tactics should we use? Uh, should we go uh, on the streets, do outsider tactics versus should we actually work together with policymakers? Should we place people inside the institution? Um, and then we have the fourth chapter, which is the one I just presented, uh, because decision-making is, is a key component and we need to better understand what we can do practically to, to improve them. And then the last chapter is um, is an agenda for further research and practice with uh, research, question, research questions and uh, recommendations. And we are quite far in the book writing. Uh, it always takes more time than, than planned, mm -hmm. um, but we hope to have a full manuscript by the end of the summer. And since it's a, sh a short format, it should be published um, either by the end of the year or early 2021, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay. And so people have lots of questions, I think, covering the range of all the different things that you talk about in, in the book. Um, I guess to start us off, uh, Nathan Young has asked, what are some of the top interventions that we should keep in our minds when we're thinking about this topic? Okay. Uh, we're thinking about improving political decision making, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think it really depends uh, who is asking this question. Um, whether it is um, an academic institution 
um, that is producing evidence and that wants this evidence to be used by, uh, by policymakers. I think there, um, what's extremely relevant is to actually design research together with policymakers um, such that the evidence that is produced is directly policy relevant. Um, but if this question is asked by a policymaker, then um, I think it's, it's like very difficult to answer. Um, I think like some of the strategies that I outlined actually could be picked up by those actors. And there, I think like a, a, a quick and dirty multi-criteria decision analysis is something that could be useful in most cases. Um, but that could mostly be applied by policymakers and bureaucrats or technical officers. Um, and I don't think that those strategies would necessarily apply when it comes to um, decisions made by politicians. Um, and I think there, like, um, what could be explored and that seems quite valuable is to increase um, the amount of like information that is shared between different politicians um, and the amount of like alignment on the framing of different problems. There's one key problem is that um, politicians use the ambiguity of policy problems and use different interpretations and reinforce this. Um, and I think the more we can minimize this, um, maybe the more cooperation we can actually get. Um, but as, as you can see, like the more in depth we go, the more uncertain we get, we get. And it's quite difficult to say, okay, what's most effective in this like complex system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, just to talk a bit about um, who are the important actors in this space and which are the imp most important kind of um, things to focus on. Um, interested in hearing your view on uh, so someone has asked about to what extent are our kind of governments important versus other bodies like uh, lobby lobbying groups and things like that and someone else has asked um, uh, how important do you think it is to educate decision makers versus the public in democratic contexts yeah um, there are like a few questions in there um, mm. so, so I think there's we, we can't really just say government is more important than, than, than lobbying. Um, I think it's more that like you look at a policymaking system and you have this interplay between government officials and lobbyists. And the result of the policymaking process is the interaction between these two and the, the, the social and technical process of trying to find compromises between those actors that have different interests. Uh, but I do not think that like lobbyists have more importance than like government officials. Mm -hmm. um, However, in, in our book, uh, when we reviewed the, the, the evidence on advocacy strategies and, and lobbying strategies, um, both advocacy groups and, and lobby groups uh, rely on insider and outsider tactics. So they rely on educating and working with um, uh, bureaucrats and policymakers, but they also tend to use um, like large campaigns to educate the general public. And Given the, the small bits of evidence we have at the moment, it seems that insider strategies work uh, better. And I think right now, if I were to allocate resources to improving policymaking, I would actually focus on educating policymakers. Uh, and again, like I don't know if like, educating is the right word, because policymakers, many of them have PhD in the field. Mm. Um, so I don't know if educating is actually the right word. I think like. Uh, decision making support um, is probably more relevant and having like an entity that brings those strategies and that is really good at training policymakers to use them um, could be particularly relevant. Mm -hmm. And then specifically on the educating decision makers versus the public? Uh, yes, yeah, so there I would say decision makers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. okay. Basically more insider strategies than outsider. Oh, yeah. Makes sense. Um, and then uh, I guess a big question on this, which, um, which sort of spans many different areas is, is this top voted question. How do we incentivize governments to work on longer term policies that extend beyond their normal term in office? And I guess particularly there's a, some uh, follow up where someone specifically talked about how a lot of policymaking is a knee jerk reaction based on past events rather than sort of science based and sort of thinking about uh, the future. Yeah. Um. So, so I think to, to answer this question, we need to probably understand like a bit more the like what the structures of political institutions come from. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a lot of path dependency. Um, like the political system is might be like unitary and uh, majoritary. Um, 
because of like a long tradition of like a monarchy system. Um, and we cannot change this um, in one day. Um, mm -hmm. And but this is something that people have been thinking about. So there is this really, really good book on uh, institution for future generations. Um, and this is also a topic that um, different people in the EA community um, are thinking about. And I think one way to improve and incentivize government to consider future generations is to implement those like mechanisms to represent future generations. So it can be like an ombudsman for future generations. It can be uh, different voting systems. Um, it can be like different election systems. Um, it can be like a different form of like a bank um, to like allocate uh, funding differently. Um, and I think like right now we have an idea of those possible mechanisms. There are more than 60 mechanisms that you can implement in institutions. We just don't really know what is uh, most effective. So I think more analysis of those mechanisms will be particularly important, especially because they come from political philosophy in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's one part, like reforming the structures. Um, and that will take a long time. Um, but I think what we can do is use the, the current routes uh, to influence policy. Um, there are um, like negotiations that are open to civil society, to NGOs, to academics, there are calls for experts. Um, and what I realized by like interacting with more and more policymakers is that there is actually a pretty strong openness to consider like third party information and third party preferences to then craft uh, relevant policies. Uh, because the relevant policies are relevant because they satisfy the preferences of the stakeholders. Um, and I think like there are existing routes and if we can use those routes, so like for example, like having lobby groups that have a long-term focus that would be particularly relevant. Um, what we're trying to do in Geneva more and more is to um, bring those like decision-making support strategies with like a long-term angle. So, uh, we're going to launch a serious game at the WEF uh, on bio risk. Um, and they're like, sorry? What was the, at the WEF, sorry? Well, at the World Economic Forum. Oh, I see. Um, and, and then at the United Nations. And then the goal will be to simply sensitize people to um, different probability of risks and different sever severity of, of risks and use the simulated setting to let them ex experience uh, what this means. Um, and I think a lot of like sensitization needs to be made um, before we can actually talk about like actual policies. Um, yeah, then like we can work with existing institutions like the Biological Weapon Convention, try to like, improve um, their resources uh, and try to support them with like more intelligence, more tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this touches on another question we've had is, do you have a sense of generally how recalcitrant decision makers are regarding changes to their processes? I.e., when you come to someone and suggest, maybe you should use this tool, do they receive that a suggestion well or stuck in their ways? Um, so I, as, as part of this book, we interviewed um, a lot of policymakers or like technical officers within governments um, and also uh, diplomats. And what I heard um, is that first, improving those processes is the elephant in the room. Everybody knows about it. Um, everybody uh, knows that it's important, but it's very difficult to change like, the meta processes of how we act within the political institutions where we're already so much time constrained to do the work that we need to, to do. Um, and I think what but like, they're like, it's, it's not necessarily because they, they, they don't want to, it's because they don't necessarily have the time. Um, and they would need like extra support to do it. Um, but then for this extra support, uh, I had discussions with um, people within the United Nations and there we pitched different kinds of trainings. And what was really interesting is that they were, yeah, but like those trainings uh, on, for example, using serious games, yeah, they, they seem relevant, but what's the evidence behind this? They were asking about basically the effectiveness of these trainings. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I, when I explained what MCDA is and the evidence that exists behind, behind MCDA, they were very interested because there's actually like decades of, um, of use of this strategy. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I basically face like pretty like um, rigorous responses um, to this question. But then I also observed um, other types of responses, like um, oh, um, especially from from diplomats, um, where, where they were like, oh, you you basically try to make us better, um, but you know like policy making is is so complex that we need to accept that we cannot control the process. We just need to let go and signal our preferences um, and network and network and network. Um, and I found this view a bit cynical, and this is not shared in the, in the entire like, policy making systems. Mm -hmm. um, but this is definitely good to know um, before like trying to supply ideas. Uh, you know. mm, interesting. It's like it's a view that sort of seems almost a little bit scary from the perspective of someone within a democratic society if it feels a little because it, it feels a little uncontrolled um but if it, it it just depends on how robustly it leads to good outcomes or not <laughs> it's interesting to get an insight um so a few people have asked i guess similar questions to those those people around um what specifically are mcdas and serious games i don't know if you can give like a sh short introduction just to give just to give a bit more uh, um insight into what those are um, so it's much easier for MCDA than for serious games. Okay. Um, so MCDA stands for multi-criteria decision analysis. Um, I think like an example would be like cost-benefit analysis, but this only has like two criteria, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea of MCDA is to have many more criteria, um, and it's actually like a, a formal process. So it's a formal process that will guide decision makers. Uh, to like defining their context first, mm -hmm. then defining the problem, defining the, um, the criteria to assess solutions to the problem, and like brainstorming options, um, assessing all the options against those criteria, and then deal with quantitative and qualitative data on those options. Um, and especially, and, and I think it's extremely important in policy, MCD allows to quantify judgment. And because in policy making, there would be a lot of judgment calls. And what MCD allows to do is that it allows to like make judgment explicit and sometimes quantify it um, such that it's actually understood by the stakeholders and the people that participate in the, in the decision making. Um, MCDA is not just one method, it, it actually has like more than 60 methods. Okay. Uh, and one of the key problems there is that different methods lead to different results. Um, so we need to have really good knowledge about which methods to select. And there's actually literature on this and a lot of debate, but this is one of the key limitations. Um, serious games, um, it's a pretty vast branch. Uh, it's, it basically defines like almost any game that has like an educational purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it ranges from um, like video games, digital games, um, uh, card games and etc. Um, and what what we selected in the chapter was like in-person games, so games where it would simulate scenarios around the table. Um, and they're like it's it's known to be useful because it shortens the feedback loop between uh, making decisions and knowing about the effects. Um, so it's basically like yeah, like a simulator. Um, People can just try different ideas, but also practice communicating about complex problems, uh, build mutual understanding, um, and etc. Okay. And yeah, there is actually vast literature on this, so I highly recommend reading this. Great, and that we're, we're just about the end of time for the Q and A. But just to finish off with, if people are interested in this, um, what should they? How can they get involved in this more? What can an EA do to to sort of what's the best thing to study, or sort of how could they get more involved in some of the particular recommendations, for example? Yeah, um, so I would encourage them to reach out to us mm -hmm. um, because there there will be many more opportunities in the future um, in Geneva and beyond. Um, I think um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tendency in, um, in, like, in, in when we do research to like focus on like original studies that like um, produce new evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think what we would answer most of the time is to recommend to conduct synthesis research and ideally uh, meta-analysis or systematic reviews. And I think this is much more valuable than just 
small bits of evidence that we might not be able to replicate. Um, sure. I would encourage to do this. It's also somewhat easier to do. Um, it needs That's to read hard. a lot. Uh, <laughs> and then in terms of studies, um, there are programs in deci decision sciences that are particularly um, interesting. And I think I would also um, put the focus on understanding um, and supporting decision making under like um, high uncertainty and in collective settings, because we know a bit more on how to optimize uh, individual decision making in contexts where we have full information and a lot of time to think about the decisions. Uh, in policy making context, we have uh, a collective setting uh, where you have multiple people that have different interpretations and we have time constraints um, and high uncertainty about the problems and the solutions. And those are extremely difficult problems. And I think really looking at them and not believing that policymaking follows like an ideal scenario where we have full information is defi definitely like a way to go forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so that I've gone ever so slightly over. I'm sorry, folks. Um, that concludes the Q&A part of the session. There was just so much to ask. Uh, but if you're interested in discussing this more, um, then we have the last 20 minutes ish of this session. Uh, it's time for some speed meetings with other attendees. Um, if you check the session description below this video, you'll find a link to an icebreaker session where we're going to gather for those uh, speed meetings. So please click on that link now and a new host will meet you on the other side. Thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, Max. Thank you.